for many, like Bloomberg, SIBO deals with massive and massive amounts of data. And I'd like for you to first share with our audience what we are talking about. Like what, what does SIBO do and what kind of data are we talking about here? So for those that don't know SIBO, we are a global exchange operator. We operate markets uh, in uh, 25 different markets in many different countries. We span equities and options, futures, effects, and most recently, digital assets. So when you think about the scope of our business, you're really thinking about trillions of dollars of notional traded on our exchanges in the course of a year. In a single day, we trade over $80 billion of equities in notional. We trade over 10 million options contracts, 200,000 futures contracts, and it goes on and on. So clearly, when you talk about uh, system hardness and data, uh, we generate so much uh, of that on a daily basis through our markets. Data that has to be absolutely accurate and secure. Uh, I have to ask you, because of the time that we are in now with market turmoil, not only do you have to deal with the massive amounts of data, but you have to deal with changing demand that goes from day to day. So on a day like today, it's probably a little bit of a nightmare for you. How do you use automation to keep up with those massive swings in demand? Yeah, well, Jen, it's a great point because, you know, so many people count on our markets to be high integrity and up. I mean, we cannot be down. We have to be up 100% of the time. And so when we think about automation, it really goes back to how we actually build and deploy our code for our exchanges. And we have a very disciplined automated process to actually roll up our code on a weekly basis. And the checks that it goes through are just so hardened. Um, we are highly regulated. And so the SEC, the CFTC, and other regulators across the world pay very close attention to how well uh, we automate our code processes and make sure our markets are up. Um, when they're supposed to be up, we just cannot ever suffer any downtime. So we pay very close attention to all of that across all of our global exchange markets. I want to ask you about the challenges of the pandemic. Every company, every industry in this room had to pivot hard. In your case, you had to go from a floor-based in-person operation to going completely online and to make sure that things didn't crash and fail. How did automation help with that? Well, that was a, a huge day. I mean, like you said, everybody in this room, I'm sure had a time when you had to look at your business when the pandemic first hit and try to figure out how you were going to take manual processes into an automated process. And so what Jan is talking about, for those that don't know, that we, we still operate a uh, in-person trading floor where buy and sellers meet, price discovery is made, and transactions happen in an in-person pit environment. And when the pandemic first hit, we were faced with something we actually hadn't thought about before. Yes, we have disaster recovery plans. Yes, we have all sorts of fail back uh, methodologies. But when something like a pandemic hit and you're contemplating taking something that happens so precisely in person into an automated virtual world, it was quite a reach for the team to be able to remedy and replicate what we do on the trading floor into a virtual environment. And so that was a very stressful weekend of trying to figure out how we were going to replicate through electronic and digitization what was happening in the floor environment. But, you know, a lot of room for error in that exercise, but really happy to say that we actually pulled that off uh, using some of the latest tools uh, that were available at the time. And I want to bring up it, to, to the people in the room that are not dealing with finance, think about this. You could not fail because if you had failed, the cascading problems that would happen, not just in the confidence of people using the platform, but everything related to it, would have been pretty catastrophic. There is no room for failure. No, it would have been absolutely catastrophic. Imagine during that period of time when the market was falling, and this was a systemic shock to the market across the world, and what we knew is people, they have things that they need to hedge. They have portfolios that they need to protect. And that's downstream to the 401k plans and pension plans that we and our families and our parents rely on. So to fail in that instance would have been catastrophic. And so it can't be lost on anybody that the exchanges, the markets that provide that capital protection have to be available for all of those that need to access it in these times of systemic shock when you most need to access that for hedging your risk in the marketplace. Because things change so quickly, 
and technology is advancing. Even the most tech savvy companies that I meet with in an interview, everyone always feels that they are catching up or they have to keep planning in order to catch up as, as things change. And despite these things that you've described, which have been pretty remarkable, you say that SIBO is still in the early days of machine learning for your platform. So where are you focused now in your migration and, and adoption? And how are you hoping that automation, what are you hoping it will help you in the future? So I think, you know, to back up a little bit, for machine learning, we've been using machine learning techniques in our regulatory and surveillance functions at the exchange for quite a while. When you think about what machine learning really does do well, it, it flushes out those patterns, patterns of nefarious behavior on our markets where you're trying to look for spoofing or other types of trading activity that's uh, not welcome in our marketplace. And so we have long been using machine learning and AI to flush out those types of behaviors. But what we're really trying to do, especially as we migrate a lot of our data and analytics into the cloud environment, is to understand where the opportunities are to produce a better end result for our clients. And really, what we're always trying to do for the clients is get them to a more actionable step in their workflow. So they're trading, they're hedging, they're trying to manage their portfolio. What they want is as close to an end actionable result as we can give them. And so we're looking at machine learning to try to get to that actionable point much faster. And we can use things in the cloud native environment like SageMaker, for example, in AWS, but all cloud environments have some native functionality that lends itself to helping us get accelerated on this path to machine learning. So, it is early days for us, but it is ever-changing, and it's really interesting and fascinating work to be involved in. Since you brought up the challenge and the need to migrate these massive amounts of data to the cloud, which is, again, something that seems to be common across all industries, I have to ask you about the security issues, because the cloud is in some ways as mystifying on a certain level as automation and AI are. So can you talk to us about how you make sure that everything is secure in that migration? So again, we're learning a lot about the, the security issues within the cloud environment. But if you think about it, you know, really the cloud environment is a third party data provider with an internet connection. And so when you take those two things about losing complete access and control of your own data, now you've introduced the internet component to it, of course there's going to be security concerns. All I can say is we pay very close attention to dipping our toe in the water of the cloud before we actually do really see changes into the cloud because of these very concerns. And because as we've covered, Janet, we, we as an exchange are so highly regulated, there's no way we can misstep anytime we do any of these technological innovations. And so we're dipping our toe in the water in areas that we feel are safe but we certainly aren't an exchange that are taking our matching engines up into the cloud environment yet, as some of our competitors and peers are actually contemplating doing. And we're waiting for our clients, frankly, to say that's where they want us to be. We have yet to have a lot of clients come to us and say, we really would like you to take your match up into the cloud, but we're listening. And should we hear that message from our clients, it's something we'll get more aggressive about. About uh, the idea that you have to have perfection, it's not just a risk of unhappy customers. You brought up earlier the intense regulation that you face. And for the companies and industries that are joining us that also operate across different jurisdictions and countries, talk to us about the challenge of the regulation that you not only face in the US, but also different standards and rules and laws and everything in, in a variety of different countries. So I first want to just say that we view our regulators and uh, our, the regulation uh, standards that we have to meet as somewhat of a competitive differentiator for us. And by that, I mean, all you have to do is look around at what's happening in crypto right now and what's, uh, what's transpiring with Luna and, and UST and now Celsius. and and just know that there's a reason we really treat our regulators as our partners because we do believe that the end client, the, the investor needs to be protected in these marketplaces. And so when you think about regulation, yeah, we're highly regulated. It can feel onerous, it is hard. It's not an easy thing to have to operate a business under so much scrutiny and so much regulation. And as you said, Janet, we face this scrutiny, not just in the United States, but in our markets in Canada, in Europe, in Australia, in Japan, 
And increasingly, as we expand even further across the globe, we're going to have to just be welcoming of the regulatory requirements that come our way and know that we're very good at navigating these waters. And it, it is a competitive differentiator for us. And it should give the individual investor a lot of comfort that we pay close attention to what the regulations are and how we can best work with the regulators to make sure we offer a high integrity market across the globe. So even as you both fear and love and appreciate the regulators, it does come down to the customer. That is, that is the, the audience, the clients that you have to protect. And you're dealing with so much proprietary information. This day and age, we are constantly hearing about hacks and breaches and such. Securing this data could not be achieved by people sitting and just watching the data. Can you share with us about the power of automation to do the jobs that is just too massive, no matter if you could hire all those people? Yeah, I mean, we actually use a lot of uh, cutting edge technology and I'm not a part of the cyber team at uh, CIBA by any stretch and so I'm no expert on the subject, but I've looked into the control room of our cyber team and it is very high tech. They're doing so much uh, to make sure that they're monitoring all of our systems for the hacks. And inevitably, I've asked some statistics about how many times do we actually get you know, some sort of attempted attack? And it is shocking, the number of attempted attacks that try to hit our network. And so they are using so much automation, so much cutting edge technology to make sure our systems are robust and that we are not getting uh, attacked in ways that we certainly do not want to be. I was uh, hosting one of these summits in San Francisco last week that was concurrent with the RSA Security Summit, and I asked everybody, so it's bad, is it going to get worse? And they say, much worse. The attacks are going to get much worse. And we, this, as we have a shortage in jobs in cybersecurity, because you not only have to validate and fight the real attacks, you have to fend off and determine what is not a real attack. That takes a lot of man hours. And so again, automation is so key there. You talked about the rollout of code, and what I was really impressed with is that you, SIBO, is generating a lot of new code every week, and you have to deploy this so that the customer, the trader, the client, actually has no idea. It's seamless to them. How do you manage this? So there's, I mean, this is where we strive with automation. I mean, so just for example, every Sunday, you know, there's an automated process where a new branch of our entire code base is launched. And then as Monday comes in and the coders begin coding, the code is automatically rolled up into this process and it's checked and it's validated and all sorts of things are happening behind the scenes. You know, sausages being made and our clients are never subjected to all of the things that we're doing. And it's not that it's all automated. There are certainly manual checks along the way to make sure that everything is passing certification and is ready for our weekly release at the end of the week. But it is so automated, the code rolling up, the code getting checked, and the processes. I mean, we pride ourselves in being able to do so much in an automated function for the way that we build and deploy code among all of our global exchanges. It's quite amazing when you think about it. Are you able to hire enough engineers? No. Data scientists? No. Analytics? So no. how do you manage? I don't think we're alone in this. I mean, I, I, if we. I ask people in the audience to raise their hands about how many people can get every person they need on the team. I think we would see very few hands. Uh, it is high demand. It's a very specific skill set. And the more automated, the more technologically driven our entire society becomes, the more, the more these types of uh, talent are in demand. And we are growing uh, tremendously, just like other companies and uh, always looking for more resources for those key uh, and hard to find jobs. And I would throw quant into that definition. I mean, we can never find enough quantitative uh, folks for the things that we build. Another challenge that you face that I found surprising is that even though you are an information, financial information transaction company, you are not immune from the supply chain crisis. How has that impacted you? Yeah, I mean, I, it has impacted us. I mean, just like anybody trying to order servers or things they might need for their, uh, you know, just a hardware builds, uh, we're, we're not immune from the, the delays in sourcing that equipment. But we are fortunate in that we're not supply chain heavy. And so we're, we, we're not getting substantial delays in many parts of, of the supply chain that would be relevant to our business. But I don't know that anybody's immune from 
what we're seeing in terms of supply chain disruption, uh, and we definitely suffer from that as well. We are down to our last few minutes, and again, we welcome you all to uh, submit questions if you have them. But I always like to ask people, as they sit in, in a role where they have to look at automation and how it's going to carry their business forward, what are the problems, the challenges that you see on the horizon that you absolutely need to increase automation in order to meet those challenges as your business continues to change and grow? So one of the things that we really have to aspire to, not just because we're highly regulated, but because people need to understand how we get to the end result of our analytics or even an index that we create, transparency is the key. And sometimes when you start introducing a ton of automation, you lose the ability to communicate the transparency of how you got to that end analytic, that end value, that end result. And so one of the things that we really have to be cognizant of is if we're introducing automation, if we're bringing machine learning into our product portfolio, we still have to be able to explain how that worked and how we got to where we got to. We can't just say, oh, trust us, you know, trust the machine learning, it worked, it, it got us to this point. People will say, I need to understand that process as well. And that's what makes it a little bit difficult is that you really have to be able to communicate transparently how that automation got you where you got. Do you have any advice that you can share with some of the industry leaders with us today on how you get your teams to adapt, especially when they have to adapt in such a, a quick and fast manner? So, I mean, we've spent a lot of time, and I think it's a topic of this conference as well, is um, really thinking about the future of work and how we want the team to engage and what their career pathing looks like. And we've really landed on this concept that you know we are all adults and we're going to trust our teammates to make the right decisions for how they want to work when they work best uh, and let them be the most productive that they can be. And we invite complete cooperation and collaboration and all of the things we build in our product portfolio. So I think it's just making sure that we give people maximum flexibility but offer those opportunities for connection. That's key. And we know we lost a little bit of that in the pandemic. Uh, but we're bringing all of that back and giving people the opportunity to come back to the office on their own terms when they want to and providing ways for all of us to connect again because it is super important. And I think all of us would agree because we're sitting in a room together that it does matter to be in person. And it's certainly great to be here with you, Janet, uh, in person today.